Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope things are going okay for you in this difficult time. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about scheduling and planning, which, like so much of AI, are things that lots of different research disciplines think of as their own these days. Uh, these things lie at the intersection of AI with operations research and some very mathematical things and all kinds of practical applications, but really that it has AI roots and sort of gets at some of the fundamental questions of artificial intelligence. And it's also a very state space searchy thing. So I think that's a thing that we can have fun with. So scheduling and planning, what are we talking about here? Well, We've already seen a little bit of it, right? We've found, we saw pathfinding on maps. We saw 24 puzzle or other sliding tile puzzle route finding through a state space. Those are really kinds of planning, right? You're trying to put together a plan to achieve some goal. Scheduling, we haven't looked at as much yet. Scheduling is sort of planning's younger sibling. It's uh, version of the problem in which instead of trying to figure out what to do, you're trying to figure out what order to do things in. And that turns out to be hard enough all by itself. And it's what we're going to concentrate on today. And, you know, industrial, the, industrially, these areas, scheduling and planning are super important. Modern logistics, modern manufacturing, modern business management depends to a huge, huge extent on computerized scheduling and planning. It's one of the big secret invisible things that's made the modern infrastructure possible. So having some handle on it seems like a really good idea for a computer scientist. So what's the scheduling problem? The scheduling problem is the problem of assigning start times to tasks. And that's, there's a lot of ways we could define it, but that's the one I'm going to use. We have some things we want to get done and we got, got to say when we're going to start doing them. Uh, if you're calendaring them, for example, that's an example of scheduling. And we typically in this research treat tasks as atomic. That is, they're all one piece. You don't break them up into smaller pieces. If you do, that's multiple tasks. We give them a name and we give them a duration. We have in this simple model we're gonna use, we have a fixed amount of time that we know the task will take to complete. Now that's not a very realistic model. One of the things we do in AI is make simplified models that we know how to work with a little better and either try to use them as is to, to address problems where they don't quite fit or try to expand the methods so that we can handle the fancier cases. And we're going to make more simplifying assumptions today. We're going to consider that, you know, the time is divided up discreetly. You can't choose, you know, a rational number as the start time. You have to pick an integer. And we'll limit the number of tasks to be scheduled to a finite number, which doesn't sound like much of a limitation, but, you know, it's something you have to say out loud. And when we ask for scheduling, it's often easy to schedule if those are the only constraints is tasks, you know, if we have very simple constraints, the scheduling problem's boring and you can solve it almost any way you want. We typically treat this as a constraint optimization problem. We have whatever constraints we have on a schedule and we try to find the shortest schedule. We try to find what's called in the jargon of the field, the make span of the schedule. We try to, um, which is the total length of the schedule across all tasks, we try to minimize that. Yeah, so short schedule is better. And certainly if you're doing manufacturing, short schedule is better in a big way. So usually the tasks we're trying to schedule are constrained in the start time. You might have a couple of different things. Here's a Here's a uh, diagram. I didn't draw this myself. I borrowed it from a paper. You can get the reference on request. 
you know, here's some tasks, and these tasks are constrained by what's called precedence links. That is, this task has to f finish before this one can start. This is a precondition of this one. It's also constrained by resource constraints. That is to say that um, this task requires three units of A, two units of B, five units of C, and so forth. And we're going to use those constraints to try to make sure that we don't, you know, those constraints might be against some kind of capacity resources. Let's say that this, is, this first one is number of people working on a job. Well, maybe we only have five people. And so maybe we can't schedule a task so that tasks so that more than five people are working on them at a time, that means we can schedule these two to go together, but we couldn't schedule these three to go together because three plus two plus two is seven. I'm gonna have to pick one of these to wait until the other one's done. And so those are the kind of constraints that we often have. Uh, we might also have deadlines, either for the whole problem or for specific tasks. Sometimes we're not actually totally trying to find a minimum length. We're trying to find a length that meets a deadline, which might be an easier problem if the deadline's fairly loose. So that's common. And like I say, capacity resources are very common. Uh, ones like people where it's the you know amount of them you're using at any given time. There's also the possibility of consumable resources, resources that you use up and that won't be replenished till later. Uh, I haven't worked on those kinds of problems so much, but they are definitely a thing that matters in a lot of industry applications. But certainly it's common to have capacity resources and precedence resources as a thing. Now if we leave the precedence resources off, we get the simple case of bin pass packing. We, we have some limit, let's say, of k tasks we can run at a time and we have no other constraints, and so it's just a question of how do I distribute the tasks, some long, some short, into you know three groups such that they all get uh, executed as parallel as possible. That's a hard problem all by itself. That's an NP-complete problem in general. Uh, if there's two or more queues. If there's one task, it's super boring, right? It doesn't matter. You don't have any precedence constraints. You don't have any other constraints. That's linear time. You just literally run the tasks in any order. So, but if the, if you have two bins, if you want to, if you have two, if you can run two tasks at a time, then this is already NP hard, which is crazy, but there we are. Uh, there's a nice paper that I recommended on for to the class earlier on number partitioning course paper on the complete karma car car algorithm which shows how to solve practical instances just stupidly fast but uh if you have big enough problem even trying to run two two-way parallelism is a hard problem all by itself now, another simple case is that we don't have resource constraints, we just have precedence constraints. So in this graph, if you imagine there are no resource constraints, then it's pretty clear how to get a shortest schedule. We run this task first, these two second, these two third, this, these two fourth, and this one fifth. That's what we call a topological sort, which you may remember from your other classes, hopefully. And that's about as easy as it gets. And a topological sort is a good first approximation to these kinds of scheduling problems in any case, even if we do have other constraints. And so the methods we use are often really related to topological sorting. So you can do a topological sort, source to sync or sync to source. That is, I can schedule a task that doesn't have any press thing that comes before it, then I can schedule all the tasks that only depend on it, and then I can schedule all the tasks that only depend on the things that came before them, and so forth, and that's a pretty standard thing, but you can go from the other end too. Schedule a task that can be last, schedule the things that need to go before it, and so forth. They're exactly the same in some ways. And 
One of the advantages, by the way, of sorting in to start is that it delays tasks as long as possible, sort of. So tasks that can be delayed will be delayed. Sometimes that's an advantage is to procrastinate for various reasons. If I want to procrastinate, I might start in to start and get a little bit different schedule than if I want to be eager and do start to end. Start to end might reduce risk. End to start might reduce other kinds of risks in that if you're going to find problems you didn't expect, you'd like to find them as early as possible so that you can decide maybe not to do this at all. So, like I say, in the general case, we have both resource constraints, capacity resource constraints and uh, precedence constraints. And so we end up with something called resource constrained project scheduling, which is its whole own discipline with its whole own stuff. In fact, there's a very, very famous tool for resource constrained project scheduling aid, which is the one that Microsoft does in Microsoft Project. And that tool doesn't actually have any AI assistance for doing the scheduling very much. It has a thing called the leveler, which is absolutely the worst piece of scheduling software I've ever seen. But it does let you work on these kinds of problems because even before we studied this as a thing for computers to do, these are just real problems that arise. I've got a I'm going to try to build a automobile and I have to schedule what are the tasks in building an automobile which ones have to be done before which other ones how much factory floor and other capacity resources do I have to build the car and I need to figure that out even bef even if I don't figure it out by some fancy computerized optimizing search so you can't just topological sort, because if you do, then like we saw here, you've got these bottlenecks where some resource exceeds its maximum value, and so you're going to have to delay stuff. And then it becomes a hard question, which one do I delay? These tasks appear to be all of unit duration, but if some of them are longer and some of them are shorter, all of a sudden it matters which one I choose to delay when I run into a capacity constraint. and that can be hard in fact it can be np hard but they we can do the obvious thing here well, for some value of obvious we can do a state space search let's try delaying this one and see if that works out if not and then let's try delaying this one and see if that works out and then we'll try delaying this one and see if that works out and in this case, they're all going to work out the same. But if these tasks were of different lengths, then which one I delayed first might affect the answer in some pretty profound ways. Well, let's try, you know, it's the usual answer of state space search, try everything. And so we can use complete search methods. We can use local search methods for trying to solve these problems. And if we're going to use the better complete search methods like A star, or if we're going to use local search, we really kind of need a heuristic. And there's an interesting thing that comes up in this situation. I mean, maybe if these tasks were of different lengths, I'd like to schedule the short ones first to get them out of the way, to make more room for the rest of the schedule. On the other hand, maybe if all else being equal, I should try to schedule the longer duration tasks first because those are the ones that are bottlenecking the schedule. We know we have to get those done as early as possible. Which one's the right answer? Well hard to tell, right? I could make a pretty persuasive argument for either one. That's a pretty common AI problem. The problem isn't thinking up heuristics. The problem is deciding which heuristics to try first. And really the only way to answer which heuristics work is to try them. It's a completely empirical answer of let's see if this heuristic works. But, <coughs> excuse me, with many, many possibilities to try, you better heuristically order your heuristics in some good order and that's part of what learning to do AI is about is sort of getting a feel for what's going to work and not work in these situations and so that's just a very brief very high level introduction to a very very complicated topic like I say people make whole careers out of state space search for solving scheduling problems I spent a lot of time in grad school doing state space search to solve scheduling problems. 
but what you can see is that we're starting to uh, be able to attack some real world problems with the methods that we're learning from just classical AI, no, no machine learning needed. In fact, machine learning turns out to be terrible at these kinds of problems. I don't know any great machine learning results that challenge the state space search results in any of these domains. So the other thing that's worth saying about that is remember this, you know, even though this isn't a philosophy class, we're starting to see problems that look like problems that humans routinely tackle that computers find difficult. You know, people schedule things all the time, and again, they probably don't find optimal schedules, and again, they're slower at scheduling than a machine would be. But on the other hand, they tend to be pretty clever and use tricks that the machine would never imagine to do it. We're starting to get into the space where it really feels like the machine's doing some more general thinking. In our next talk, which is about general purpose planning, we'll extend that idea even further to the domain of figuring out what you're gonna do next in terms of actions, which is very much a part of the human experience. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for listening. Again, please stay safe and well out there, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.